you know, as we are approaching uh, the day that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, uh, that the world calls Easter, I, I think back about how growing up in church and hearing about the resurrection of Jesus and then what we knew at that time about the uh, the end times or maybe the second coming of Jesus, uh, which is not what as much as what we know now. Um, I was always uh, intrigued, I guess, by the, the point that uh, the dead in Christ are going to resurrect also. And it was a number of years after that. I'm not really sure exactly when. But uh, I can't really say it was any time before, oh, say, 1971, that I remember encountering the word and the concept of the rapture. And uh, that was, of course, an explanation of the resurrection of the dead. It was really kind of, a, of an explanation of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, where it says... Uh, the, the trumpet will blow and the dead in Christ will rise and then we who are alive and remain will be caught up with him in the clouds and, and be with him. And I guess rapture, the word normally in English, means a, a glorious ecstatic event. And so, yeah, I, I guess being raised from the dead certainly would be a glorious and ecstatic event. I mean, that's why uh, on celebrating the resurrection of Jesus, it, it's glorious. And, and so... These two things seem to be connected, kind of in my mind, I guess, is that the resurrection of Jesus and the rapture sort of fit in the same cubby hole in my uh, religious upbringing, I guess I'll have to say. And so, there's a lot of things in the Christian world today that are taught about the rapture, and what at Romans 8, we have taught is probably not a, what a lot of other churches in the Christian world teach. But as I was thinking about this, I, I was struck with something. And that is that ever since I first heard about the rapture, and I think this is probably true for a lot of people, I was more concerned about, well, when's it going to happen? You know, how soon can we... Uh, can, can things change? How soon can this awful world full of sin and degradation be fixed? And, and how soon can we get out of here? How soon will we rise to meet him in the skies? And so on and so forth. And so, and that's a very common thing, I think. Um, people want to know when this is. And, of course, Jesus gave us signs about what the end times would be in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, and um, in this, uh, the last hmm, 70, 80 years, we've seen a lot of those signs come to pass. So now, I guess people are really uh, waiting for the rapture. Uh, but maybe what we should be doing is not focusing so much on when that is, as much as we are what it is, why it is, and what, rather than just sitting around waiting for some future event, what being prepared for that entails. And so, in this series of messages that I've been doing this week about the hidden kingdom, uh, I'd like to talk about that it's what and not when. Now, the scripture where Jesus actually says that in so many words. For example, in Acts chapter 1, uh, I'll read verses oh, 3 through 7. It says, uh, To the apostles, Jesus showed himself alive after his suffering at Gethsemane and on the cross by a series of many infallible proofs and unquestionable demonstrations appearing to them over a period of 40 days and talking to them about the things concerning the kingdom of God. While being together and eating with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, of which he said, You have heard me speak. For John, 
the Baptist, baptized with water, but you will be baptized and empowered and united uh, with the Holy Spirit not long from now. Now, he didn't tell them about the rapture here. He told them about being filled with the Holy Spirit. But it says that, so when they had come together, they asked him repeatedly, Well, Lord, are you at this time reestablishing the kingdom and restoring it to Israel? Now, you see there, he promised them the Holy Spirit, a, a, a divine gift, a divine empowering, and they took that and, and translated that into, oh, well, we're going to get a, an earthly power base uh, back established like maybe King David had back a thousand years earlier or something to that effect. And he said, and this verse is generally misunderstood and misconstrued. He said to them, it's not for you to know the time or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. Now, a lot of Christians say, well, see there, he said, uh, you're not going to know. Well, that's not quite right, because then why did he give them all of those signs in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, and then just erase all of that and say, well, no, you're not going to know, so just don't worry about it. That's not what he meant when he said, it's not for you to know the times and epochs. What he's saying to them was in answer to their question about establishing the kingdom. So, here's the deal on that. People, even his followers, even his apostles, even born-again Christians today, don't really understand what uh, the kingdom of God uh, entails. So, that's why I say it's really more about what than it is when. Because if we don't get the what, um, we're not going to be ready for the when. I'm not saying the when's not coming, and I'm not saying nobody knows when it is. Uh, I, From what I see going on in the world right now, I believe it's fairly close. I mean, within just a matter of a few years. That's my opinion. But rather than get tied up on that question right there. Let's talk about what the kingdom of God is according to what Jesus and the scriptures have to say about that. I'm going to give you seven things tonight, and that's just a scratching of the surface of what the kingdom of God is, but I think it's a good place to start. In Luke chapter 17, Jesus made a very important statement about the kingdom of God. And once again, he was asked, well, when is the kingdom going to be restored to Israel? Or I guess that's what he was asking. It says that he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. Well, you know, there's a reason why the Pharisees wanted to know that. It's because a few hundred years before Jesus came, uh, the Greek Empire was ruling Israel, but they became rather corrupt and weak, and uh, the Jews rose up and overthrew the Greek domination of Israel for about a hundred years. And it was during that time that the Pharisees and the Sadducees arose as sects within Judaism, and they were continually vying with each other for who was going to be in power during that time. Well, through all of that squabbling, eventually the Romans saw an opportunity and the Roman general Pompey came and he conquered Israel. And so once again, Israel was under the domination of a foreign power. So I'm supposing the Pharisees wanted to know if that was going to change and when that was going to change. And Jesus said, here's what he said to answer their question. He said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed or with a visible display, nor will people say, look, here it is, or there it is, for the kingdom of God is among you, it's within you, I think is another way to say that. The kingdom of God is within you. 
what are we saying here? We're saying that the kingdom of God is not an external thing. It's an internal thing. I've been doing this whole series about how the kingdom of God is a hidden kingdom currently. That's not to say it will never become externally visible, but right now it isn't. But that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And in Luke chapter 11, verse 37, um, here's a little interesting interplay about how the Pharisees misunderstood, and this is the way I think most people misunderstand about spiritual things. There was a Pharisee that had invited Jesus to have lunch with him. And so Jesus went to the Pharisee's home and reclined at table. And the Pharisee noticed and was surprised that Jesus did not first ceremonially wash his hands before the meal. But Jesus said to him, Now you Pharisees, you claim the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give of that which is within as charity, as acts of mercy and compassion, not as a public display. And then, indeed, all things will be clean to you. So, number one, the kingdom of God is a matter of the heart. It's not a matter of externals. It's not a matter of natural, physical, material uh, things that can be quantified, things that can be counted. You know, uh, people frequently have asked me over the years about our church, Romans 8 Ministries. Well, how many people go there? Um, and this is a question most churches kind of want to, uh, to advertise if they have a lot of people that go there. Well, see, that's the point that Jesus was trying to make to this Pharisee is that it's not an external matter. It's an internal matter. Okay, go to next Matthew chapter 16. Here's another rather well-known thing that Jesus said. Matthew 16 and Jesus was asking in verse 15 he was asking his disciples who do you say that I am and Simon Peter replied you are the Christ the Messiah the anointed one the son of the living God that's what any Christian will believe about Jesus, okay? And Jesus answered him and said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, which means a rock, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys, the authority of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Well, now, you know, the charismatic movement has really gotten a hold of that binding and loosing thing and the authority that Jesus gives his followers. But let's don't miss something here. He gave that authority, he said, to Peter and really to the rest of us because Peter recognized that Jesus was divine, that he was the Son of God, and Jesus, that faith and, and that revelation that he had is what Jesus said he is building his kingdom with. Now, 
the faith and the revelation go together. They, they are intricately bound together. Now, uh, psychologists and, and uh, sociologists and medical professionals and many other people um, say that, that uh, prayer helps uh, people who are, are suffering from a disease or suffering from any kind of misfortune. And if they're not uh, Christian, then they, they might still say that. They might still say, well, it really doesn't matter what God you pray to or it doesn't matter what you have faith in. It's just simply the fact that you have faith. And uh, some would even call that, well, mind over matter. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. He said He's commending Peter's faith because Peter had faith in something that was revealed to him by God. And he said he didn't get it through natural means. So there's another thing that the kingdom of God is built upon, is faith in what God has revealed. Now go to Habakkuk in the Old Testament. Not an easy one to find, but it's toward the end. It's right before Zephaniah, if that's any help to you. Uh, in Habakkuk, speaking of faith, there's something else about faith. Faith is not just a belief system. I mean, it's at least that, okay? But it's not just that. In Habakkuk, we have a pretty good uh, explanation of what faith is and how it works. Habakkuk chapter 2. Uh, if you read Habakkuk chapter 1, you will see that the prophet Habakkuk is crying out to God about the sorry state of affairs that he has seen in front of him. And then in the beginning of chapter 2, he says, I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the tower and I will keep watch to see what God will say to me. Now, this illustrates another side point, by the way, and that is that prophets understood themselves, Old Testament prophets understood themselves to be what we would call watchmen, that, that they, their job was not simply just to spout theological truths, but it was to offer those theological truths in response to actual conditions that were happening in the world. So he says, I'm going to watch and see what God will say to me and what answer I will give if I'm reproved, if I'm questioned. And then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, engrave it plainly on tablets, so that the one who reads it will run. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. It hurries toward the goal of fulfillment, it will not fail. And even though it delays, wait patiently for it, because it will certainly come. It will not delay. Look at the proud one. His soul is not right within him. But the righteous will live by his faith. Now, there's something there in verse 3 that is... Another one of these things that what the kingdom of God means as far as us as believers in Jesus. It means patient waiting. You know, as I said, I guess it was probably 1971 or so. That was around the time that Hal Lindsey came out with his book, The Late Great Planet Earth. And uh, I began hearing uh, talk of end time prophecy coming from ministers and so forth. And... There, were a lot, there was a lot of speculation, even back then, about when Jesus was going to come back. And a lot of it uh, was not wrongly uh, interpreting things going on in the Middle East. You know, there was the, uh, um, the Six-Day War in 1967, and then there was the Yom Kippur War in 1973. And so people saw this as these were prophetic markers in time, and so 
uh, many ministers began to speculate that there would be certain dates that that would would fit some kind of a of a uh, prophetic pattern of 40 years or 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, so forth. And then some of those years came and went, and then all of the uh, brouhaha about Y2K came along toward the end of the 1990s. And uh, we were told that all the, the world's uh, electric grid and infrastructure was going to crash because it was all uh, connected, uh, interconnected to computer things that, that were not programmed to to uh, to turn over when the year 2000 turned over. And then when that didn't turn out to be the case, then a lot of uh, Christian prophets had to go back to the drawing board and, and examine things again. And then, you know, a little later, uh, the September the 11th came along and people were thinking, oh, well, this is going to be, you know, Armageddon here. This is the start of World War III. And, of course, it wasn't. And... Therefore, uh, a lot of people kind of gave up on the idea of the, uh, the last day's prophecies being fulfilled, at least during our era here. But, you see, faith requires patient waiting. That's what he just said here. In fact, in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says the same thing. He says in Hebrews chapter 9 that if you want to be a recipient of the highest and best that God has, and let's just say that involves uh, you being raptured out of here uh, before the earth gets bombarded by uh, things from outer space or something. Um, it says in Hebrews 9, verse 28, So Christ, having been offered once, that was when he was crucified, right? And once for all, to bear the burden of sin for many, he will appear a second time. Jesus is coming back, folks. He is coming back in the flesh to this earth. Uh, while this earth is still intact, it's not going to all blow to smithereens and then, then we're all going to heaven on a little grass boat or something. No. Um, he will appear a second time when he returns to earth. And then he's not going to deal with sin but to bring full salvation. Well, I thought if we believe in him dying for my sins, then we have salvation. Yeah, yeah, okay, you have salvation from hell, but that's not the only thing God is saving us from. Hell is not the only thing God has to save us from. And it's not just what he's saving us from, but it's also what he is saving us for. He is saving us for the kingdom. You know, you can save something, you can have some trinket, or you can have some precious thing, and you can put it away in a drawer or something. You're saving that for a special occasion, right? Well, that's what that's what he's talking about here when he says he's uh, to bring us to full salvation, those who are eagerly and confidently waiting for him. Now, some want to say, well, okay, that means I'm just going to go on about my life and not worry about it. Well, no. That could almost uh, morph into ignoring the whole situation. No, if the Lord has showed you, as he showed many people, uh, and let me say this about that. Sometimes when God shows you something, it's not a, a loud voice, thunder rolls, and you hear a, a an echoey voice, this is God telling you. You know, sometimes it's just a, a quiet inner knowing. You know, that's how he spoke to Elijah. He says it was a still, small voice. Well, that's why, it's, why Jesus said the kingdom is within you. Sometimes we can know something from God without really having formulated it as a concept. Well, anyway, so we know he's coming because he has showed us this, and so we're to wait. All right. A fourth thing, this is in Rome. a fourth and a fifth thing, by the way. This is in Romans chapter 14. This is another verse that's rather often quoted 
but I want to dig into it a little bit. This, this is one of those where it pretty much explicitly defines aspects of the kingdom of God. Romans 14, verse 17. It says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of food and drink. Hmm. Let's stop right there. I mean, why, why do we have to have money? Why do we have to have jobs? Uh, why does there have to be economy? Well, because people have to eat to live. Okay? But he's saying here, the kingdom of God is not a matter of that. Now, that is a radical statement, folks. The kingdom of God is not food and drink, but it's righteousness and it's peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, I say there's two things there. It sounds like there's three. But I'm going to deal with peace and joy as evidence of, of one kind of thing, which that would be fruit of the Holy Spirit. We'll get to that in a minute. There's a scripture that lists peace and joy and several other things and calls them fruit of the Spirit. So we'll discuss what fruit of the Spirit is. But first, what is this thing about righteousness? Well, and for that matter, what do we mean by a fruit of the Holy Spirit? Well, it means these are gifts. These are things, we're not talking about things that we have to come up with on our own, that we have to uh, produce through our own effort or through our own natural uh, abilities or our genetics or our upbringing or tradition or anything else. Righteousness, it says, is a gift. And that's in Romans chapter 5. It explicitly says that righteousness, as, as it pertains to us, has to be a gift. It says, For if by the trespass of one man, Adam, death reigned through that one, much more surely will those receive those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Well, now, there's something else about reigning in life with this gift of righteousness. And this, this has been twisted a little bit, too, in contemporary Christian teaching to mean that, well, it's just, it's just a, a get-out-of-hell-free card, or it's just a, you know, God just considers you righteous, so don't worry about whether you are or not. Yeah, you're a sinner saved by grace, but God says you're righteous because you accepted Jesus as your Savior. No, there's a little bit more to it than that. What the gift of righteousness means is when He gives you righteousness, you start saying, doing, and being right, whereas before you weren't. You start doing the right things when before you were doing the wrong things. And I'm not saying you have to do those things in order to become righteous. No, you got that backwards. What I'm saying is when God gives you righteousness, you start doing right, whereas before you were doing wrong. And once again, it's from the inside out. But that's, that's the gift of righteousness. And in Revelation chapter 19, it, it tells us this. Revelation 19, verse 7. This is a, a picture in heaven of of the redeemed, the ones who have raptured, if you will. And it refers to them collectively as the bride of Christ. That's a whole nother sermon in itself. But it says, let us, verse 7, Revelation 19, verse 7, let us rejoice and shout for joy. Let us give God glory 
For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride, the redeemed, has prepared herself. She has been permitted to dress in fine linen, dazzling in white. For the fine linen signifies the righteous acts of the saints, the ethical conduct, personal integrity, moral courage, and godly character of believers. Now, let me say this again. It's not like you have to screw up your courage and you have to produce all of this stuff in order to get saved and to be right with God. But what it is saying is, I don't care what, what a lousy excuse for a Christian you might be right now. You, if you have Jesus in your heart, you are better than what you were before you had Jesus in your heart because Jesus did some righteousness work in you. Now, I would say there is a completion that it is describing here in Revelation chapter 19, and that's, again, a whole other story, the story about the bride and the marriage supper of the Lamb and so forth. <clears throat> but I'm simply making the point that God gives us, when we accept Jesus as our Savior and Lord, he gives us a supernatural ability to change our ways, to start doing right, where before we had no intention or desire to do right. Or even if we did, we didn't have the power to do it. And he gives us the power. And that's what right, that's the gift of righteousness. Okay, but what about the fruit of the Holy Spirit? I always thought that was a funny Funny way to describe it, you know, it was, uh, it was uh, apples and oranges and lemons and bananas and pears of the Holy Spirit. Well, no. The point is not what the different flavors are. The point is that they grow. They grow uh, on a tree, shall we say, and the tree is the Holy Spirit's tree in us. It, you know, you can, uh, you can understand, say, your circulatory system in your body that, that sends blood to all parts of your body. You can, you know, if you were to look at a, at a uh, you know, um, some kind of a medical um, diagram of that, it would look kind of like a tree, okay? Well, the work of the Holy Spirit in us producing peace and joy and the other things that it produces could be compared to a tree. That's why it says that these things are fruit in Galatians chapter 5. It lists these. Spells them right out. Galatians 5 verse 22. It says, the fruit of the Spirit. And I like the way this version of the Amplified says, that is the result of His presence within us. So <clears throat> that fruit, that result of him being in us is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such, there is no law. So sounds to me like <clears throat> that these things, that this is our, these are our assignments, I guess I would say, is to allow God to work these characteristics into our lives. <clears throat> okay, here's another one. Actually, two. Two more things that, that God wants to do before we are raptured, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And again, I'm not saying there's not a rapture. In fact, really, there's two of them. That's a whole other story, and that's not really what this message is about. But the what that precedes the, the, those events is really what we need to be focusing on here. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Well, let me read first verse 6 through 8. 
the reason why is in, in the context here of 1 Corinthians 4 that Paul is discussing this is because even there in the first century in Corinth, there were different factions, just like there's different denominations. And even within a denomination, there's, there's uh, those who believe one way and there's those who believe another way. Or there's those who believe that this teacher has got it right and others think, oh, no, he's a heretic, and so forth. There were divisions in the church in Corinth. And so here in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6, he says, Now I have applied these things about factions to myself and Apollos for your benefit, believers, so that you may learn not to go beyond what is written in Scripture, so that none of you will become arrogant and boast in favor of one minister or teacher against another. Hmm. Wow, if the body of Christ would take that to heart, things would be a lot different than they are right now. I'll say that for sure. It says, For who regards you as superior or sets you apart as special? Oh, but we want to be special. Well, what do you have that you did not receive? See, I mean, if these things are gifts of God, then then we it's not because we're such good little Christians that we get them. I mean... If, if we have, if there's anything good in us, we should give God the glory for it. Now, me too. <laughs> uh, if, in fact, you have received something from God, why do you boast as if you had not received it, but had gained it by yourself? You behave as if you're already filled. Already you have become rich. You have ascended your thrones and have become kings without us. And how I wish that it were true that you did reign as kings, so that we might reign with you. So he's not saying, oh, well, you're not supposed to be a king ever. You know, you're only always just going to be a, a slave. No, if, if God is preparing a kingdom, that means he's preparing us to be kings. He's preparing, he wants us to come to a place of spiritual maturity so that we are fit to rule and reign. Again, that's a whole nother sermon. But now in verse 20, this is really where I wanted to go, it says, the kingdom of God is, first of all, it is not. The kingdom of his God is not something. Well, what is it that it's not? Well, simply put, he says it's not words or talk. Now, I looked that up in the Greek because I thought, well, hmm, you know, that's that seems a little problematic theologically because after all our faith is based upon the word of God but he's saying well the kingdom is not word well uh, and it does uh, that I looked that word up a word it is logos the same thing as well the word was made flesh and that's Jesus he is the word made flesh so okay then so what are we saying the kingdom of God is not based on word but on power What he's saying is, it's not simply a matter of believing in a certain set of precepts or giving mental assent to a certain theological doctrine. Keep the place here in 1 Corinthians. We'll get back to this in a minute. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Here's, what he's, here's a, a better uh, elaboration of what he said right there in 1 Corinthians 4.20. In 2 Corinthians 3, verse 5, Paul says, Well, not that we, we apostles, are sufficiently qualified in ourselves to claim anything coming from us. For our sufficiency and qualifications come from God. He has qualified us as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter of a written code, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Okay, you know, we, we've heard this saying, you know, something uh, in spirit and in truth, okay? 
Well, that means that it's a living reality, and it's not just a, a theoretical, hypothetical concept. There's a lot of things in this Bible that, honestly, I guess for me, I would have to say they are theoretical, uh, in that uh, maybe I haven't experienced the, the full extent of them, or, or it's describing an experience I've not had. I, I, I won't say that I don't believe it. And, and Paul is not, over there in 1 Corinthians 4, he was not saying, uh, don't put your faith in the Bible. Now, let me say this about that. There are some Christians out there who say, well, no, you don't need to read that book. That's all intellectualism. You just need to go experience the power. Well, here's the problem with that. If you disconnect your experience from thus saith the Lord, then the devil can come along and give you a counterfeit and you can think that something that's of the devil is of God. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that every miraculous thing that happens is of the devil, but I'm saying God is not the only one that can make miraculous things happen. God is not the only one that can make you feel goosebumps if, if uh, you have prayed a prayer and something happens or, or if you have... Uh, decreed something and it comes to pass. Okay, this is my point. And so, when when he says that the kingdom of God is not based on talk, in other words, it's just saying that it's not just words on a page. God wants this book here to be more than words on a page. He wants it to be a living reality for us. And when this book becomes a living reality on us, then we are entering into the kingdom of God and we are being made fit to govern. You know, there's something about competency in, in, in any area. Uh, music or uh, history or uh, mechanics or, or whatever, you know, whatever area of human endeavor you want to say, when you are competent in something, you've done your homework, you've read the literature, you've tried things out, you've experimented, you've made a lot of mistakes, you found out what works, you found out what doesn't work. You've probably been deceived and deluded and misled a bunch of times and gone down some uh, blind alleys and rabbit trails and, and you've had to, to fight your way back to the, to the straight and narrow and after many, many years of that, you gain wisdom. Okay, so that's what I mean when I say it, it's a living reality and not just a concept. Okay, not saying there's anything wrong with concepts, but God wants those concepts to be more than just concepts. He wants them to be living reality. And here in 1 Corinthians 4, it says the kingdom of God is not based on talk, but on power. Well, let's talk about that. Go back to Acts chapter 1. I stopped at verse 7. Let me read verse 8. He says, You will receive power. And that word does mean ability, efficiency. The word is dunamis, from which we get the word dynamite. So, it will actually... This power that he's talking about means it, it really can accomplish something. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in all Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. See, to be a witness for God, to be the kind of Christian that we need to be, he's saying we've got to be empowered from the Holy Spirit. To do that. That's just as well, okay, I know I'm supposed to do this, so I'm just going to go out and do that, and God will bless it. Well, if you're not empowered, the, the, the influence of that is going to be way, way short of what God wants it to be. Now, let me, let me point out some things here. Go to Luke chapter 11, talking about power. God does want to empower us. But there is a goal. There is a reason why he wants to empower us. Not just so, oh, I've got the power, you know. Um, 
just so we can be the, the big kahuna, spiritually speaking. No, that, it's not for that. And as soon as you go there, you, you're, you're cruising for a bruising, as the expression goes. But in Luke chapter 11, verse 20, Jesus said, If I drive out demons... Oh, you mean there's such things as demons? Yes. I'll tell you something about that in a minute here. But he says, If I drive out demons by the finger of God... It's a metaphor he's using here. The finger of God drives out demons. Like, okay, what do you do with your fingers? Well, you point at them, okay? You, you type, you play an instrument, you drive a car, you plow a garden, you do a lot of things with your fingers, okay? So that implies uh, accomplishing something and not just in, in a broad, crude way, but in a very specific, very accurate way. You know, if I go over to the piano and just slap the thing, it's going to sound like crud, okay? For it to sound like music, I have to be very precise with what finger goes on what key. Okay, so he's saying, I drive out demons by the finger of God. And he said, by that you will know that the kingdom of God has come upon you. In other words, he's saying, Look at, look at me. I, I, I cast out these demons. People were always coming to Jesus. They had demon problems. And he commanded those things to leave. And they left. And everybody was impressed with that. And really, they still are. People, people come to us with, with psychological problems or with all kinds of, of thorny social issues that they can't get a handle on. And uh, when, when spirit-filled Christians uh, sit down and pray with them, uh, physical ailments. The, these things can go. They can just be gone. It's like, well, how did that happen? It's because there is a spirit world, all right? And the spirit world, not everything in the spirit world is good. It's like rocking and well, Are they good spirits? No, they're not all good spirits. The bad spirits are demons, okay? And Jesus taught us to deal with it, and he says that the kingdom of the power of the kingdom of God would be directed toward getting rid of evil. So if you want to know, what should I be doing with that power that Jesus gives me? You should be pushing evil out of everything that you can recognize that's evil in your world. Now, you may not be able to push all the evil out of Washington, D.C., and you may not be able to push the evil out of Hollywood. And, and I mean, okay, if you want to pray about it, go ahead. But that's not... That's not the part that's important for you. The part that's important for you is you getting rid of the evil that besets you. And there's all kinds of, and that's, you know, that goes back to that fruit of the spirit thing. If you're depressed, then that's evil. And you need to, to with the, with the finger of, of the power of God, you need to command that thing to get out of your life. And in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, Jesus gave his disciples that authority. And they came back and said, Oh, Lord, we, well, even the demons obey us in your name. And, he, and Jesus said, Listen carefully. I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. Now, it's metaphors again, because remember, uh, the, the devil appeared to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden as a serpent, right? So, and you know, in Revelation 12, it refers to Satan as that age-old serpent, okay? And, and that's, you know, intuitively, people just know that that's a representation of evil. Uh, I've given you power and authority over serpents and scorpions and over all the power that the enemy, Satan, possesses and nothing will in any way harm you that is to the degree that you operate properly with that power. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at that, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Well, what does he mean? Uh, rejoice that you're going to go to heaven one day when you die? No. The kingdom of God is an invisible kingdom. Heaven, we, we can't see heaven. I mean, we see the stars, but that's not even, even in the, the Bible, it says that there's another heaven 
uh, that, that's more inaccessible than the heaven we see. The heaven we see, we might call the, the, the first heaven or the second heaven. And, and the heaven where God is, the dimension or the realm where God is, uh, Paul referred to that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 as the third heaven. Well, uh, that's, that's good enough. We, we don't have to scientifically locate where in the universe heaven is. What he just told us right here is that the kingdom of heaven, there's another place where he says the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. The devil, that this is a spiritual war going on in that hidden realm. And God wants us to use his authority, his power, to accomplish what we need to do to be successful in that war. So, I've given you seven things tonight that are prerequisite, I'll say, to you going out of here in the rapture. They're not prerequisite for you going to heaven if you die. That, that, that is settled when you make Jesus the Lord of your life, okay? And this doesn't, this is not a, an additional qualification for you to get saved and go to heaven. This is something that God wants us to get established here in our lives now so that when he comes back, if we do get this established in our lives now, we will be a remnant which who will be fit to rule and reign with him because he says there will be those that do. Amen?